SCP-1050, Obsidian Obelisk of Warning. Object Class, Safe. Special Containment Procedures. SCP-1050-1 is to be maintained in a storage facility with interior dimensions of at least 5 meters by 5 meters by 32 meters. The ceiling of the storage facility, specifically the area over SCP-1050-1, must be shielded to block radio wave broadcasts at an intensity of redacted, see addendum 2. SCP-1050-1 is currently stored at area 179. Occurrences of SCP-1050-2 are to be located upon identification of the corresponding change in SCP-1050-1. These are to be located and confiscated by Foundation agents. SCP-1050-2 is to be stored in secure classified document storage. Instances of SCP-1050-3 must be tracked by monitoring radio telescope telemetry. When an instance of SCP-1050-3 is detected by non-Foundation personnel, all records must be confiscated and or destroyed. An affected person should be administered amnesiacs. Description SCP-1050 is consists of one item, SCP-1050-1, and two related phenomena, SCP-1050-2 and SCP-1050-3. SCP-1050-1 was recovered from a secret German facility in Redacted following the conclusion of the Second World War. SCP-1050-2A was recovered from Soviet NKVD archives in 1950 Redacted. SCP-1050-2B was recovered from British Crown archives in 1950 Redacted. SCP-1050-1's previous origins are unknown. SCP-1050-1 SCP-1050-1 is a large obelisk made of solid obsidian with approximate dimensions of 1.48 meters by 1.48 meters by 30.5 meters. These measurements correspond with archaic length measurements of the Roman pace, equal to 1.48 meters. Dr. von Schmidt According to obsidian hydration dating of the obelisk, the obelisk itself was carved approximately 48,900 redacted years ago. Microscopic scans indicate it is perfectly shaped at the molecular level, indicating creation requiring technology in advance of that available at the present. The obelisk is covered by a variety of writing scripts, all con apparently containing the same message and all apparently carved with the same exact precision as the obelisk itself. The surface of the obelisk appears to be subdivided into 80 1.48 meter by 1.48 meter sections, each with a distinct form of writing. Of the 80 sections redacted of them have been filled. Images of several of the carvings on SCP-1050 are in Addendum 3. Linguistic analysis of the scripts indicate the following in chronological order by gap, except as noted. Redacted, as of yet unidentified scripts bearing no resemblance to any known language or writing style, past or present, with carving dates rating from 48,000 redacted years ago to two-digit redacted years ago. These are presumed to contain the same message as the other scripts. A script of unknown origin dating to the creation of the obelisk, whose spelling and grammatical structure resembles early forms of ancient Latin, though the alphabet and numeral system are completely different. Yeah, who symbols? SCP-1050-1 has provided the ability for linguists to read the previously indecipherable G.I. who symbols from ancient China but the Foundation has not released any information relating to the Jaihu symbols to the scholarly linguistic community due to the classified nature of SCP-1050-1, Akkadian cuneiform, Egyptian hieroglyphs, Linear A. SCP-1050-1 has provided the ability for linguists to read the previously indecipherable Linear A from the ancient Minoan culture but the Foundation has not released any information relating to Linear A to the scholarly linguistic community due to the 
classified nature of SCP-1050-1. Olmec script. SCP-1050-1 has provided the ability for linguists to read the previously indecipherable Olmec script from pre-Columbian Mesoamerica, but the Foundation has not yet released any information relating to Olmec script to the scholarly linguistic community due to the classified nature of SCP-1050-1, classical Latin, early medieval Swedish runes, modern English circa 1891, modern Russian circa 1943. All scripts appear to contain the same message. The following is the English version of the message as written on SCP-1050-1. Footnotes provide conjectural annotations by the research team. With the exception of a change in ruler and date when the message was proclaimed again, this message appears to be identical in all languages on the obelisk. Beware the destroyers. They come by the millions from the realm of darkness which extends where no star shines. Conjectured to be interstellar space, possibly intergalactic space. For a thousand generations they slumber. Lying in wait, great nations rise and flourish. There is peace and prosperity. Then comes the dark times. Then they return. They call and burn. They are warped and move beyond the pale, bigger than any man, unnatural births. Every nail, claw scale, and spur, every spike and welt on the hand in those heathen brutes is as barbed steel. It is said that there is no honed iron hard enough to pierce them through, no time-proofed blade that can cut. Their brutal blood-caked claws, preceding description, they are warped claws, appears in Beowulf, Armies are raised and cut down like grasses before a scythe. It is said the armies of Amora and Sudam, archaic Tiberian spelling of Sodom and Gomorrah, each 10,000 strong were swept between a single rising and setting sun. Heroes come forth and are slaughtered. Lightning and fire rain from the sky and the whole earth trembles. They are as a deluge, a powerful flood that washes away in mighty nations and empires. Possible origin of the flood myths that appear across most ancient cultures. The people pray for deliverance from the gods. The gods fight the destroyers, but their efforts are in vain. Iapetos, ancient Greek titan, son of Uranus and Gaia father of Atlas, Prometheus, Epimetheus, and Menotaeus, ancestor of the human race through Prometheus, Epimetheus, and, Tit and Atlas, titan of mortal life. He was imprisoned in Tartarus by the Olympians. Iasir, archaic form of Osiris, ancient Egyptian god of the afterlife, underworld, and the dead. He was killed by Seth and had his body torn into 14 pieces, which are then scattered throughout the lands. Ehacatl, pre-Columbian Aztec wind deity, associated with Quetzalcoatl. Sochong, deified ancient Chinese general, more commonly known today as Guan Yu. All perished. The destroyers are to the gods as the gods are to men, and men are to insects. Cold and vast and unsympathetic. The wise flee them. The lucky escape. Fifty score great vessels are launched to seek refuge from them. Only they are led by Satyavata, initial name of the Hindu figure Manu, believed to be the first king to rule this earth, having saved mankind from the universal flood. Utnapshtin, survivor of the flood myth in the Epic of Gilgamesh. Noah, archaic spelling of Noah from the Abrahamic flood myth. And Dukalin, a son of Prometheus in Greek myth. He and his wife Pyra survived the Greek mythical flood by building a chest. Escaped. The Dark Ones vanquish all before them. They have come before or since time began. Now they slumber and they will return. Beware of the destroyers. 13 0 57 935 897 End at Karen extinction event, 542 million years ago. 13 
13082937367 and Botium extinction event 517 million years ago 13082989898 Thirteen zero ninety seven nine fifty one two nine nine Drep is bacon extinction event five hundred and two million years ago thirteen zero nine eight zero zero four two forty thirteen one fifty four nine fifty zero two nine Cordocovian extinction event four hundred and forty five million years ago thirteen one fifty four nine nine seven eight four one 13-171-943-486. Iarcavian event, 428 million years ago. 13-171-996-357. 13-175-947-117. Mold event, 424 million years ago. 13-175-997-684. 13-175-997-684. The Lao event, 420 million years ago. 13, 179, 990, 180. 13, 183, 948, 781. Ancillarian extinction event, 416 million years ago. 13, 183, 999, 048. 13, 232, 952, 474. Late Devonian extinction event, 367 million years ago. 13, 381, 981, 481. Carboniferous rainforest collapse, 318 million years ago. 13, 282, 002, 364. 13, 329, 941, 108. Olson's extinction event, 270 million years ago. 13, 329, 990, 159. 13, 348, 945, 350. Permian Triassic extinction event, 251 million years ago. 13, 348, 994, 654. 13, 394, 942, 237. Triassic Jurassic extinction event 205 million years ago. 13 394 994 635. 13 416 953 628. Torconian turnover 183 million years ago. 13 417 005 920. 13 454 440 174. And Jurassic extinction event. 145.5 million years ago. 13, 454, 492, 003. 13, 482, 994, 398. Aptian extinction event. 117 million years ago. 13, 482, 991, 663. 13, 534, 433, 334. Cretaceous tertiary extinction event. 65.5 million years ago, dinosaurs go extinct. 13, 534, 484, 218. 13, 566, 069, 136. Eocene Oglokian extinction event, 33.9 million years ago. 13, 556, 119, 652. 13, 585, 446, 914. Middle Miocene disruption, 14.5 million years ago. 13, 585, 499, 555. 13, 599, 896, 703. Quaternary extinction event, approximately 50,000 years ago. 13, 599, 945, 679. Possible date range, data expunged by O5 command. Proclaimed again by Her Majesty Victoria, by the grace of God of the United Kingdom of Great Britain, and the Ireland Queen, Defender of the Faith, Empress of India, in the year of our Lord, 1891. The end of the message is different for each time it is written, varying by which ruler proclaimed again the message and by altering the date accordingly. Testing has revealed the dates of the carving of different messages to correspond with the approximate dating provided by the different iterations of the message. So far, foundation mes 
researchers have identified the following rulers. Legatus Maximus Romulus, 53,500 redacted BCE, original carving, Croto-Latin, with alternate alphabet. King Gilgamesh of Uruk, 2,500 redacted BCE, Akkadian cuneiform. Pharaoh Kakuro Sensurit III of the Egyptian Middle Kingdom, 850 redacted BCE, Egyptian hieroglyphs. King Midas of Manoa, 800 redacted BCE, Linear A. Caesar Publius alias Trinius Hadrian August, Augusti, Emperor Hadrian of Rome, 122 CE, Classical Latin. King Eric the Victorious of Sweden, 985 CE, Early Medieval Swedish Runes. Queen Victoria of Great Britain, 1891 CE, Modern English. Premier Joseph Stalin of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, 1943 CE, Modern Russian, Most Recent Carving. The meaning for the series of numbers appearing in the message is not known for certain. However, it is assumed to be the standard Earth years from the date of the Big Bang, then the numbers follow a pattern consistent within four significant figures, with the major extinction events in the planet's history, followed by a date roughly 50,000 years later. Extensive investigation into prehistoric extinction events has thus far failed to definitively confirm a connection between the events, but has similarly failed to disprove such a connection. SCP-1051 also emits 1050-3 from its apex, despite apparently having a composition of solid obsidian. SCP-1050-2 SCP-1050-2 consists of documents with text equivalent to the carvings on SCP-1050-1, apparently written by the rulers alleged by SCP-1050-1 to have proclaimed the message. The existence of SCP-1050-2 was discovered when the Russian message, apparently proclaimed by Stalin, mysteriously appeared on SCP-1050-1 overnight while the obelisk was in a Nazi research lab during the Second World War in 1943. SS researchers discovering the mysteriously added new message reported the development to their superiors, but no evidence for the origin of the new carving was ever determined by the Nazi research team. SCP-1050-2A, a, a version of the message written in Stalin's handwriting, was discovered after the war by Foundation operatives. It was located in the archives of the Soviet People's Ministry of Internal Affairs, NKVD, though there is no clear indication whether Stalin ever actually wrote the message. SCP-1050-2b, a handwritten version of the message, apparently written by Queen Victoria, was recovered from British archives in 1950 redacted, where it had apparently been filed without notice. Apart from the fact that both 2a and 2b match handwriting samples from their respective apparent authors, and both appear to have been appeared without explanation, no anomalous properties have ever been noted in SCP-1050-2. No further instances of SCP-1050-2 have been uncovered to date. SCP-1050-3 consists of a series of radio messages uncovered at different times by radio telescopes on four continents and in orbit. These messages consist of the following. Que que destront. 131, 531-520-067-324. 131-520-231714. 131-735-163-354. 131-735-330-606. 132-114-132-402. 
The numbers have been determined to be a base 8 octal representations of the 40 base 10 decimal integers in the obelisk message preceded by another 60 integers following a similar pattern. It is hypothesized that these numbers may refer to additional events not documented in Earth's paleogeological history. The Proto-Latin message translates roughly to Beware the Destroyers. SCP-1050-1 emits SCP-1050-3 from its apex, SCP-1050-3 has also been received from redacted other directions in space, including data expunged. These are received as occasional pulses of 1.3 repetitions of the SCP-1050-3 message, suggesting similar directional broadcasts to those emanating from SCP-1050-1 being transmitted from rotating planets orbiting other stars. Addendum 1 Speculations by SCP-1050 Research Team, 19 Redacted. SCP-1050 appears to be parts of an interstellar early warning system of unknown origin. Before the invention of more modern forms of rapid communication, some societies would light bonfires atop watchtowers, which would then be observed by the next watchtower, which would then light its own bonfire, and so on. By this method, a warning of an invading army could be passed along tens or hundreds of miles in hours rather than days. It appears to the research team that SCP-1050 may be something similar, which would explain the signal we've designated SCP-1050-3. Similarly, by having the message written on the obelisk in dozens of languages and apparently proclaimed by major political rulers of the time, it would increase the likelihood of societies being forewarned about these destroyers, whomever or whatever they may be. SCP-1050-2 might be a means of spurning the governments of major political powers to action, though due to the fact that this warning has not been visibly taken seriously or even publicly acknowledged, success suggests that this has not occurred historically. While it might be attractive to assume such defensive measures such as Hadrian's Wall or military buildups by the Nazis were due to preparing to meet some shadowy preternatural threat, no other historical evidence supports this conclusion. Addendum 2. Notes on Containment Procedures Since the Foundation came into possession of SCP-1050-1 in 1940 redacted, O5 Command has twice amended the special containment procedures, initially requiring the blocking of radio signals, 1940 redacted, then requiring the radio signals not be blocked, 1960 redacted, then requiring that they be blocked, 1980 redacted. 
These changes have resulted not from alterations in SCP-1051, but rather from changes in the perceived threat posed by SCP-1050-1 radio transmissions. The rationale behind blocking SCP-1050-1 broadcasts of SCP-1050-3 is that it decreases the likelihood of drawing attention to Earth by removing this planet from the theorized early warning network. The rationale behind not blocking the signal is that if the theories about the possibility of future extinction events being caused by the mentioned destroyers are correct, then this planet has some degree of obligation to warn other planets in danger. At present, the benefits of broadcasting the signal are believed to outweigh the benefits. We have to dismiss that claim. This is going to kick the top of the anthill, you know that? General Pendergast asked, looking up from the report. Dr. Rex Scott. Yeah, well, I can't help it if that Dr. Von Schmidt is an idiot, or that so many fools actually listen to his ridiculous ideas. Pendergast shook his head. Besides, General, you wanted a realistic assessment? There you go. Pendergast sighed. Rex, the point of Project Heimdall is to assess our risks. The O5 Council takes the destroyers mentioned in SCP-1050 very seriously. Ah yes, destroyers. The mythical race of warped abominations allegedly awaiting in the realm of darkness. We can dismiss that claim, General, spat Rex. There is not one shred of evidence to support the theory that aliens drop by every... 50,000 to 50 million years and wipe out large percentages of life on this planet. Not one! I mean, unless you count a single artifact which makes wild and unsupported claims. Every major extinction event in this planet's history caused by the same thing? Come on! What about the transmission? asked Pendergast. What about it? It's three words in a predecessor dialect to Latin followed by 100 numbers, Rex retorted. And some of those numbers are the base 8 equivalent of what's on the obelisk, Pendergast continued, exasperated. So what? Rex asked. More than half of them aren't. Pendergast massaged his graying temples. Doctor, don't you think it at least theoretically possible that... No, General, I don't, Rex said. He sighed exasperatedly. Let's just look at what we know for certain, not what von Schmidt guessed, what we know. All right. Obsidian obelisk of improbable size, covered in a bunch of different languages, all saying the same thing, and inexplicably picking a signal which be happens to match something occasionally picked up by radio telescopes. Rex began. What does the text say? He walked over to Pendergast's blackboard and he picked up a piece of chalk. Beware the destroyers. Okay, now that's a helpful statement. They come by the millions from the realm of darkness which extends where no stars shine. Millions, right, probably hyperbole. Also, where is this realm of darkness? Space, replied Pendergast. Rex looked down his glasses at the general condescendingly. Really? Remember, where no stars shine, there's nowhere on this planet that if you looked up at the clear night sky 48,000 years ago, that you wouldn't see stars. I mean, now we know about intergalactic space, but back then? No way. This isn't some space opera cosmic horror story, General. No, if you want somewhere dark without stars at least from the primitive worldview of Paleolithic man, you're talking a cave or underwater. Look at mythological descriptions of the underworld. Hades, Niflheim, those are the places to look. And the Foundation has spent decades digging around looking for subterranean and submarine monsters. You'd think we'd have noticed millions of something. Okay, moving on. For a thousand generations they slumber, lying in wait. That's got to be hyperbole. 
no human society has ever kept records, even in oral tradition, that accurately keep track of things over 25,000 years. Remember, writing only rolled around in the past 10,000 years, Rex said. But the writing on the obelisk, objected Pendergast. What? The writing that magically appears overnight. We made that? Rex asked. Okay, brief description of peace, prosperity, blah blah. Then they return, they call and burn, they are warped, and move beyond the pale. Bigger than any man, unnatural births. Every nail, claw, scale, and spur. Every spike and welt on the hand of those heathen brutes is as barbed steel. It is said that no honed iron hard enough to pierce them through. No time-proofed blade can cut their brutal blood-caked claws. This passage also appears in Beowulf, which, I might remind you, is fiction. Then it seems likely the author of Beowulf was either the obelisk or a contemporary version of Dash 2, Pendergast retorted. It would make sense, actually. Remember that one of the messages on the obelisk was written in 985 in early medieval Swedish runes. Right. Rex said, except Beowulf is about a le legendary Gaidish hero who was roughly contemporary with when the story was first told. We think, Pendergast countered. Even if Grendel or his mother, or both, are destroyers, and I'm not saying I believe that, then that would actually support the subterranean or submarine origin of the destroyers. Remember, remember, Beowulf has to chase Grendel's mother to her lair, which was under a lake, Rex said. Nothing extraterrestrial about that. Huh, Pendergast said. This was an aspect of the text he never considered. Yeah, Rex said. I still don't think these destroyers are real or aliens, but that doesn't excuse lazy analysis. The least von Schmidt could have done was done it right. Anyway, from the description we can get that these alleged destroyers are supposed to be big, ugly monsters. If I showed Ancient Man a tank, what do you think his response would be? You can kill a tank with a bazooka, General. Pendergast stood and picked up a piece of chalk of his own. But what about the next part, Rhett? Hex? Armies are raised and cut down like grasses before a scythe. It is said the armies of Amora and Sudom, each 10,000 strong, were swept away between a single rising and setting sun. Heroes come forth and are slaughtered. Rex was unimpressed. If you had a 100 tanks and you go up against 20,000 guys with spears and bows, what do you think the result is going to be? General, when was the last time you heard of a spearman beating a tank in combat? Tanks? In ancient times? The general asked incredulously. Alien invaders? The doctor countered. I'm not saying these destroyers, if they existed, were tanks or anything like that. My point is that they could be something, apparently, completely unrelated to 1050. They could even be something the Foundation has encountered and contained. Pendergast raised his eyebrows. Like what? Rex scoffed. You want me to guess? I don't know, 682 maybe? Or 173? Or maybe Abel? I have no idea, but we can't account for where any of these objects were 50 millennia ago. Maybe it was 682's great-great-great-granddaddy. You've made your point, Rex, Pendergast said quietly. Ignoring him, Rex rambled on. Just because we know, or I should say, strongly believe, that there is a threat, does not mean we actually have the foggiest idea what that threat actually is. Rex, Rex showed no sign of stopping his rambling tirade. However, we have a lot of information about this object. That we know, I mean, not just we think we know, but we don't know that there is a threat, much less anything about what the threat might be. Enough, shouted Pendergast. 
Rex blinked, he'd been so absorbed in his thought that it took volume to shake him out of it. Resuming his usual quiet volume, Pendergast asked, What about the connection to Sodom and Gomorrah? Do you assume that the biblical accounts of those cities' destruction through fire and brimstone are literally true, General? Rex asked, that the Almighty decided to smite them. Besides, their historical existence is still in dispute by archaeologists. The Bible indicates they were located near the Dead Sea, but we've not found proof of their her having been there. Pendergast nodded. Petty, arrogant, and bad with people as Rex was, he had a point. Beyond that, if von Schmidt's analysis is correct for a change, and the numbers are dates in Earth years since the Big Bangs, then none of those dates are within human history. Even the most recent one, Pendergast observed skeptically, no other written or oral history dates back that far, at least not that we know of, Rex said. Sure, there were humans around, but 50 or so thousand years ago is a long time. Remember, this SCP notwithstanding, it is generally agreed that the first true writing of language was only invented in 3200 BCE in Mesopotamia, and then independently in Mesoamerica around 600 BC. Writing numbers came first, but even then we're only talking about 8000 BCE in Sumer. Pendergast nodded. So 1050 indicates human writing is five times older than we thought. Except there's no clear evidence humans ever actually carved anything on the obelisk, Rex said. Remember how the Nazi scientists went home for a night only to come back and discover the Russian version of the message had appeared as if by magic? Pendergast thought about that for a moment and decided to push Rex back on track. After all, the doctor had failed to answer this question. Could the biblical accounts of Sodom and Gomorrah have come from this SCP? If they did, then that would call into questions centuries of scholarship on biblical scholarship. It answered Rex. It is incredibly implausible for the biblical Sodom and Gomorrah to have been destroyed by destroyers, unless, of course, our understanding of where the Bible comes from is completely wrong. Pendergast raised an eyebrow. Rex, you've worked here long enough to know that stranger things have happened. Is it possible? Sure, but not probable, the doctor replied, adjusting his glasses. And on top of that, this message is a warning from ancient aliens who happened to visit this planet to warn us about other ancient aliens who appear out of nowhere every few epochs to write out, wipe out the majority of life on the planet? I know this foundation handles some crazy stuff, but come on. Sighing, the general asked. Okay, what about lightning and fire rain from the sky and the whole earth trembles? Sounds like what I understand modern artillery bombardment and aerial bombing is like, Rex replied. And this stuff about the destroyers being a powerful flood that washes away entire nations and empires? Pendergast asked. Rex shook his head. General, you know that there are flood myths in just about every culture, but apart from this obelisk's message, we have no reason to think they refer to anything other than, well, water. The people pray for deliverance from the gods. The gods fight the destroyers and their efforts are in vain, quoted Pendergast. 343, notwithstanding, how many gods do you know? And even if you include him, how many gods do you know that actually bother interfering? Rex asked. Pendergast was not a religious man, but he'd been brought up by church-going parents and was therefore less than amused by Rex's comment. Before he could say anything go, Rex continued. And this whole bit about the destroyers being as the gods are to men and men are to insects? Sounds like a bit like something out of Lovecraft, doesn't it? Or perhaps Star Wars. There's always a bigger fish. Really? 
and this escape fleet of fifty score great vessels? asked Pendergast. It wasn't until relatively modern times that fleets could be expected to weather storms without losing a ship or two, Rex said, or for that matter, to be almost completely wiped out by storms. Pendergast returned to his desk. So you honestly think there is no threat here? General, the chances of anything coming to wipe us out are a million to one. Thank you, Ogilvy, Pendergast thought trying not to smile at the unintentional irony of Rex's cho choice of phrase. All right, Doctor, SCP-1050 isn't what we previously believed it to be. Then, what is it? I don't know, Rex admitted. But just because I can't provide an alternative doesn't mean the Foundation's current guess is anything other than speculative bullshit. Imaginative speculative bullshit, to be sure. But bullshit nonetheless. Pendergast shook his head and looked up. I hope you are right, he replied. I'll forward your report. Dismissed, doctor. As Rex left, Pendergast muttered to himself. I hope you are right. <laughs>